with almost $3 billion spent in MLB free agency this offseason and still more to be spent with notable free agents still on the market. We are talking best and worst signings of the MLB offseason so far, and we plan on making this one episode, but we talked too goddamn much, and now we're making this two episodes. So in this first one, we are going to give you our three best free agency signings of the MLB offseason. We go back and forth telling you which teams and players made the best and biggest splashes of the offseason, and you are not going to want to miss the names on these lists. And this is all coming up next on the Bush League Bros. Roll the open. You now, certainly plenty of fanfare between these two brothers. Just complete Bush League. The little brother just trying to annoy big brother. If you look at it on the surface, it's Bush League. Something about that sticks in my craw. What's up, everybody? Welcome into the Bush League Bros, partner of the House Call Sports. I'm here with Taylor. My name is Matt, and today we are giving our best and worst signings of the 2024 offseason. But before we get into that, please do us a favor. Subscribe to the channel. And I got to say, the incentives I gave last episode worked. Okay, I told you guys to subscribe or Taylor would cry for all 30 minutes of this episode. And we have like 50 more subscribers going into, in the, into this episode. So first of all, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you for subscribing. I was ready to do it, by the way. He I was, was ready. I had the ammunition to cry. He had the tears. He was going to do like the actor thing where he like pulled from previous experiences and he was yeah. like going to he was going to be ready to cry. But clearly, like how Mookie Betts and I are the same age and Mookie Betts can do <laughs> every single thing in the world that I can't do. Just he like that. And 300 and I can, you know, maybe get to like 145 on a good and it was going to bowl. It was going to get 30 minutes worth of tears out of you. And so thankfully. You, you guys clearly didn't want to see him cry, and neither do I. So let's the same deal applies now this episode. Now that I'm episode, thinking about okay? Mookie Betts, I might do it anyway. Yeah, they might do it anyway. So the, listen, the same deal applies this episode, okay? So if you don't want to see Taylor cry, subscribe. Now, let's get into our three best and three worst signings of this offseason. Obviously, we've seen some historic contracts given out this offseason, billions of dollars worth of deals given out by just one team uh, in the Dodgers, and contracts themselves changing and changing the landscape of how we see free agency going going forward and by the way a few of the biggest free agents have still yet to sign in fact we pushed this episode back a week to give them more time and they still haven't signed so whatever we say we might as well just do it now okay and but with all that okay there still has to be good contracts and bad contracts taylor so we are going to start by giving you our three best signings of mlb's 2024 offseason so taylor give me your number three best signing of the offseason. Yeah, when we were planning these episodes out, uh, I thought we were being, being pretty generous with our timeline for this one. Like, there is no way that anyone notable is still not going to be signed uh, by this point. And, uh, yeah, you yeah, hear that, we're, Boris? We're, we're wrong on that. When I'm looking at these signings, I try and keep my standards for these signings very simple. Did the team address a need here, and was it for a good price? And so the first team I want to get to here, and I'm cheating because I'm including two players as this one signing on my list, but it was kind of the same move. Uh, it's Michael Walker and Seth Lugo to the Royals, and mm. I'm combining them because, you know, you're, you're signing essentially the same type of pitcher two times, uh, and I think what the Royals have done here is they've basically purchased the foundation for a consistent rotation for the next two years for like $31 million a year. The Walker deal is two for $32 million, two years, $32 million total. Uh, he has a player option after the 2024 season, which he's going to take unless he like absolutely shoves somehow in the Royals, like win the division. Uh, Lugo's deal is three for 45 with a player option after the 2025 season. Lugo had a 3.57 ERA over 26 starts with 141 in the third innings pitched, but he did have a 4.42 expected ERA and allowed a fair amount of hard contact. Waka had a 3.22 ERA over 24 starts, 134 in the third innings, but he had a 4.27 expected ERA with a 2.66 BABIP. So there's signs for regression there. But what I like is that even if these guys regress, they're regressing to basically average starting major league pitching. And average starting major league pitching is good starting pitching. And even accounting for that regression with these guys, you're looking conservatively at like 250 to 300 innings of league average starting pitching behind Cole Reagans, who is a top 10 Cy Young favorite by Vegas odds right now. And considering they only had three starters last year that threw over 100 innings for them with Zach Granke, Brady Singer, and Jordan Lyle, 
and all of them had ERAs over five. This is a massive improvement to this Royals rotation. And the other thing that I love about these signings is it's the organization showing some faith in the younger players on this team. This is a young and hungry team that really thinks right now that they can make a run at the AL Central. And while I think the odds of them winning more regular season games than the Twins or even the Guardians is still relatively low, I think those odds are better than most people think. And the front office going out and spending a bit on veteran guys like Waka and Lugo and even, you know, some of the guys they got on the offensive side, like Hunter Renfro and Adam Frazier, I think tells the younger players on this team, we think we've really got a shot to do something special with this group of guys soon. And I think the more that those guys believe that, the better chance that that's actually going to happen. And then, you know, if all of this goes awry and it doesn't work and the Royals are the worst team in baseball and none of this works out, you've got a couple great trade pieces that you can deal away at the deadline either this year or next year. So as far as spending $31 million to improve your roster goes, I think this is pretty much the best thing the Royals could have done with this money, which is why I have them here on my list. Yeah, Taylor, like you mentioned, I think they did great. I had a, I think you saw my audible, or not my audible, my visual reaction to uh, looking at the ERAs of the Royals staff last year. Like Jordan it's Lyles bad. is the only guy, yeah. the only guy qualified to, uh, technically qualified to, to for ERA. And he, so and it, it says he's leading one. the team and leading the team in ERA at 628. So yeah, yeah not, not the best. And I think Singer's going to have a better year because I think last year he started off the year he was on the WBC roster and he kind of came out and struggled a little bit. Combining him, Reagan, and then those two guys you just mentioned, Walker and Lugo, I think that could make for a really solid rotation in Kansas City and could definitely make them uh, uh, you know, uh, in contention for that AL Central title for sure. There's a chance this Royals rotation is like not bad going into this year. Yeah. I think the lineup is solid, which is why I like the front office also backing them up with a signing like this. No doubt. And I mean, you know, you just mentioned, you know, you had three the, the three guys who threw the most innings took up about 500 innings and the best ERA was still over five you know so if you have better than that you know you're gonna be a lot better baseball team and I think we can definitely pencil that in for the Royals as you know they're gonna have a lot better rotation this year and they're gonna I'm, I'm with you Taylor I think they're gonna give themselves a shot at taking that AL you know taking a shot at the AL Central there's no doubt about that but for my number three listen first of all for any of any of you guys who are following us from the house call sports we did this last year as well okay and I went along the same lines I did last Last year, I didn't put any one year deals in mind because to me, there isn't a bad one year deal like you can get out of a one year deal that next off season, So there's no bad one year deals. And I didn't put any re signings on these lists as well. These are all players going to new teams on multi year deals. OK, so for my best contracts of the off season, I went a couple of value signings. OK, that I think are super solid for quality of player that you are getting and could potentially get. And the first one that I loved is complete bias. I'm going to admit it. It is 100% complete bias, but I like this move right away, even though a lot of fans didn't for whatever reason. Okay. My number three best signing of the offseason is Marcus Stroman (laughs) to the Yankees for two years and $37 million. Again, I'm a Yankees fan. Complete bias. I know it's 100% bias. Okay. He's just really, really good pretty much every single season. Okay. He's pitched eight full seasons in the MLB, five with an ERA plus of 113 and above. Okay. And the other three seasons, one was 104, still slightly above average one it was 97 slightly below average but he threw 204 innings okay that's an amount of innings even at a slightly below average level that is massive taylor i don't know if i don't know about you but if you told me he'd do the exact same thing this year with the yankees 204 innings at a 97 eri plus i mean like sign me up like i'm cool with that you know because that's so many innings to be eating and even if you're at a slightly below average level i think that's still a really really valuable pitcher in the mlb and the other year He was bad, and he still threw 184 innings. So he's going to eat innings even when he's not at his best. Now, those innings have went down each of the last three seasons. He's decreased the amount of innings he's thrown, but he's still thrown over 130 innings the last three seasons. And again, he's still a guy you can rely on to pitch a lot and get pretty deep into games too because he's going to keep his pitch count pretty low because he's going to pitch to contact because of that sinker, and he's going to get a lot of ground balls. And we're going to see if Volpe is really a gold glover for real this year with Stroman on the mound because he is going to get a lot of ground balls when Stroman is on the mound. So Stroman on the mound is as steady as they come. He always shows up. You know what he's going to be year in and year out.
year out. He is remarkably consistent. You look at his FIP year after year, every single season it's in the threes, besides his rookie year when it was 2.8. He's got that confidence on the mound. He's got the swag on the mound that you know he can deal with New York, and he gives you confidence in him in a playoff environment as well because he has that, I don't know any better way to put it. He's just got a lot of fuck you to him. He's like, it doesn't matter what's going on around me, what you have to say about me. Fuck you. I'm going to get it done. And as a competitor, that's what you want on your team, and that's what you want to compete against too if you're on the uh, on the opposing end. So the fact that you get all of that for just two years and $37 million, you're not you know paying a crazy AAV. You're not, it's not a super long-term commitment, and you're getting a really, really good starting pitcher for, for all that. Uh, I think it's an awesome addition for the Yankees, and that is my number three best signing of the offseason, Taylor. Yeah, I like that at a number three. That was one of those signings where at first I didn't quite know how I felt about it. That's grown on me as time has passed, especially when you look at the question marks in the rest of that rotation, particularly with Rodon. Uh, yes. It seems, I mean, all, all signs are pointing to another season of that dude struggling. And now that we know that we have Marcus Stroman in the mix for that three, four middle part of the rotation, it makes me feel a lot better if Rodon just totally tanks again this year and I think a lot of people are expecting a bounce back from Nestor which yeah. you can't always count on bounce backs uh, but again no. even if Nestor doesn't bounce back you feel a little bit better knowing that you have the consistency of Stroman interesting history with the Yankees organization too I was kind of surprised uh, I was surprised that he signed with the Yankees but this is one of those situations other people have talked about this already but the Yankees are one of these organizations that it's like who cares what happened in the past if you show up yeah. and you shove like we don't care. Like, the, Play the good. past yeah. doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, we care about winning yeah. this year. So I think. Play good for us. Yeah, I, th- I think Yankees fans are going to love him. 100%. Yeah. I, the, any organization that does take stuff like that into account, I don't think you're doing a good job as an organization because you have to bring you have to bring in the players that are going to do best for your organization, right. the things that yeah. you need. So, you know, who cares if he said F the Yankees a couple times? Like, you know, yeah. if he wants to play for the Yankees, Most come play for the Yankees. Have. You're going to. Yeah, pretty much so. everyone has. I think we both did last year watching <laughs> yeah. the Yankees. So yeah, yeah I think, including Yankees I, fans. Yeah, so I think uh, I think he's going to do great in New York, no doubt about it. But Taylor, I'll kick it back to you, man. Give me your number two best signing of the offseason. Yeah, well, this one, uh, this one I almost didn't put on here as two, but I found this stat which I really liked. There are six players who had a K rate under twenty five percent, a walk rate over ten percent and an isolated power over 250 in 400 plate appearances in 2023. Those guys are Shohei Otani. Good. Matt Olson. Good. Ronald Acuna Jr. Good. Jordan Alvarez. Good. Mookie Betts. Good. And Jorge Soler. Wow. Uh, I really like this signing for the Giants. The Giants needed to add power, and they went out there, and they got one of the best power bats on the market for three years, 42 million. And that's only going to run through his age 34 season. He's projected at 30 home runs in 2024, which is taking into account the fact that he's playing at Oracle, which is well known for being a notoriously stingy park for home runs. And out of Soler's 36 home runs that he hit last year, 32 of those would have been home runs at Oracle, which is encouraging. Soler was also in the top 10% in terms of max exit velocity, expected slugging and expected woe last season. And if you're a Giants fan that believes in clutch hitting, which apparently Bill James believes in that now, which is great news for numbers people, you'll see that Solaire had a 197 WRC plus and his 53 high leverage plate appearances last year, which makes sense because he was also the 2021 World Series MVP with the Braves. The downside to this signing is that Solaire basically has no defensive value at this point, and his time in the outfield has steadily declined over the years. Last year, he only appeared in 32 games in right field. He only started 31 of those, and he only finished 14 of those. So he was getting pulled for a defensive sub in most of the games that he played in. And with how funky that right field is in Oracle with Triples Alley kind of back there, it's hard to imagine him spending a whole lot of time learning the nuances of that park and playing back there. And while this is a very clear downside, I think this was priced into the deal because if this guy had any potential positive defensive value, this deal is more towards the $20 million a year range, which it's not right now. So regardless, I do think this is a great signing for the Giants because for $14 million a year, they've effectively changed the dynamic of their whole lineup. They had a clear need for power and they won out and just got one of the best power bats available at a good price. And since it's only a three-year deal, they don't have to worry so much about how Slayer's power is affected uh, by this age regression. So great job, Giants. I, I really
really like this one. Awesome signing. This is one that I wanted to put on my list, too, because I love Soler as a player. Obviously, he I'm partial because he has one of my favorite uh, postseason moments in recent memory, uh, partially because he hit an absolute, absolute monster <laughs> nuke uh, yeah. in game six against uh, against the Astros. And maybe it was mostly because it was against the Astros. But hey, uh, it was like that moment <laughs> was one of my again, it was one of my favorite playoff moments ever and that ball is still going he absolutely yeah. demolished that ball so uh yes i mean Soler's a proven like like i just talked about proven playoff performer world series mvp like you mentioned taylor and then two we forget this guy led the league in home runs in 2019 he had 48 homers like i'm really excited and i think that Soler edition was a really really good addition but taylor my second best contract of the offseason is also a giants signing and it's one that happened oh. a week ago today and it was very delayed and we figured it might end up being on the, a shorter term deal with a lower AAV. But considering what we saw Bellinger got, uh, this deal wasn't that surprising. But it's going to be a Scott Boris client. My second best signing of the offseason is also going to be a San Francisco Giant. I'm going with Matt Chapman. Three years, $54 million to the San Francisco Giants. Now, we got our live reaction to this signing because we were about to record last week. And then we got the news that this signing was happening. And obviously, we didn't have much time to prepare. So our thoughts kind of came out a little bit scattered. All right. And I still believe overall... It's obviously bad for Scott Boris and not great for Matt Chapman. And I still believe it doesn't make the Giants World Series contenders or anything really close to competing for the World Series. But the more I thought about this, it's very similar to the Stroman signing. The quality of player you getting on his average season combined with, you know, his good year upside, like if he has a good year, the upside of that combined with the lack of huge finan financial commitment that you put into him, this signing is awesome for the Giants. I mean, Matt Chapman is a damn good baseball player, ladies and gentlemen. We've seen him be a top seven MVP guy in the league twice before, okay? We've seen his defense, four gold gloves at third base, 12 defensive runs saved last year at third he had an OPS plus of 108 last season, even with his flaws offensively, obviously predominantly being his strikeouts. He strikes out a whole lot. But again, he's never had an OPS plus below 100. He has never been be a below average hitter his entire time in the MLB. Okay. Even in his down year in his career so far offensively, it was 2021. He still hit 27 homers and at least brought something to the table offensively while still being a gold glover at third. Okay. And if you're, if you're the Giants, it's a max three-year commitment, okay? Even if he's bad, that contract ain't killing you with the AAV that he's got. Also, the fact that there was a five-year, $100 million offer on the table for him, and then you basically get him for half of that for the Giants, it's crazy, okay? Plus, if he's good, you have one of the best defensive third basemen in baseball, okay? So I think Matt Chapman going to the Giants, even though it was, you know, just happened just recently, and again, we kind of had our, you know, just kind of knee-jerk reaction type thoughts to it. The more and more that I thought about it, I'm like, man, a, a player that good going to a team for that little amount of money i think that is an objectively huge win for the giants taylor and i like that we both had we had solaire and chapman as as our two as our number two best signings because i think as a as a group like those two signings i mean they did so much for this lineup this was just the lineup yeah. that you looked at and it's like i can i can see jung hu lee doing some good things on offense. I know Tyro Estrada is going to slap the ball around. I know Lamont Wade Jr. He's going to get on base and he's going to have a little bit of pop. I mean, they're just not very inspiring characters if you're looking to right. get like hyped about the Giants season. But then you add mm -hmm. a guy like Jorge Soler, who you know is going to hit for power. You add a guy like Chapman, who you know at least is going to play really great defense for you and could potentially mm -hmm. add a ton of power if he can yes. if 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 he can adjust a little bit. Uh, it makes you feel a lot better about that lineup. And one of the things I talked about in the in our live reaction video was the stability he adds to the left side of the infield I think is invaluable when you've got a guy like Marco Luciano over there right now who can clearly do it with the stick a little bit and they're just not quite sure what the what the defense is going to be like um, so I I do really like this signing it's kind of a bummer for Chapman since he, you said he turned down that deal he also turned down that long-term deal with the A's uh, allegedly mm -hmm. uh, and yep. so you've got to wonder how he's feeling about all of that right now and oh, I, I'm hoping that he comes out and has a big year because he really is one of the best defensive third baseman over the past over the past five years um and it shows in a lot of these the stat cast lollipops you know those red lollipops that you like to see on the stat cast page mm -hmm. he's 100th percentile in hard hit rate 
98th percentile in barrel rate, 98th percentile in average exit velocity last year. Somehow that only resulted in 17 home runs. A lot of that, I think, was because of they changed the dimensions of Rogers Park a little bit. There was a lot of funky stuff going on with the Blue Jays last year. I'm really looking forward to seeing what he can do in it with a change of scenery. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to see what the Giants do this year. Are they going to go out and sign one of these remaining free agent pitchers as well, because then you're looking at a team that actually could, could, you know, could do some damage here. Uh, But I love the lineup a lot more with Chapman in it than with J.D. Davis as your starting third baseman. No disrespect to J.D. Davis. We had that one guy comment on our Chapman video and called (laughs) Chapman Crabman, which was pretty funny. funny. But yeah. it was like, man, I'm just reading this in J.D. Davis's voice mm-hmm. right now because he seemed to just be totally blindsided by this. He apparently thought he right. was going to be the starting third baseman. And now all of a sudden it's like, oh, yeah, I guess I'm not. Uh, You're okay. kind of me rolling on that, by the way. This <laughs> definitely came from J.D. Davis's burner account with your response. <laughs> to that. Yeah, that was, that was yeah, that was hilarious. So um, but yeah, I mean, even even J.D. Davis, I mean, you know, signing Chapman gives you another P a solid piece in J.D. Davis where, you know, he's either coming off yeah. the bench or you could use him as a tr- as trade bait to get in, right. you know, and, and yeah. you know, bring in another potential arm. But Taylor, come on, man. It's that time. Give me your number one signing of the 2024 offseason. This might surprise people, and it also might not surprise people at all. Uh, It's Mitch Garver going to the Mariners. Mm. This was a two-year, $24 million deal with a mutual option for 2026. Uh, Wearing the Mariners hat, a little bit biased, but I do really like this signing, I think regardless of my bias. Uh, The big risk with Garver is obviously his health. He's only played 209 game regular season games since 2021, which is, you know, averages out to about 70 games a year. And it's not just limited to one thing injury wise. If you look through his injury history for the things he's missed time for, you'll see ankle, back, groin, back, arm, COVID, arm, knee. Uh, so not, not a great array of injuries to have. And I think part of that is because Garver is still trying to be, play through all this as a catcher, but by all accounts, it seems like the Mariners aren't going to use him much if at all as a catcher this year, which makes sense because they already have that workhorse catcher in Cal Raleigh. So if anything, Garver is going to be their third catcher, maybe a couple games at first base, but he's largely just going to be DHing for them, which should mitigate a lot of these health concerns. And the Mariners aren't one of those teams that have another guy that you have to pencil in at that DH spot like the Dodgers have with Shohei or like whoever JD Martinez goes to. So they can pretty much just hand that roll over to Garver, which I love because when he's on the field, his production at the plate is unreal. He's yeah. put together just some unbelievable stretches at the plate. We look back to 2019, which of course was that juice ball year, but Garver hit 31 home runs in 359 plate appearances and had a 155 WRC plus, which is league adjusted. So that's taking into account those inflated juice ball numbers. And he was still 55% mm-hmm. better than the average hitter. 20 2021 in 207 plate appearances, he had a 137 WRC plus. 2022 was a bit of a lost year for him, but then last year with the Rangers with around 300 plate appearances, 138 WRC plus, 19 home runs. You know how that story ends. It ends in a World Series. And of course, you love the power that Garver brings. But what really impresses me and why I have him this high up on on my signings list is the ability to hit for power with the reduced risk of strikeouts and whiff, which is one of the things I mentioned with Soler. So let's compare Garver to some of the guys that he's potentially replacing on paper in the Mariners lineup, which would be Jared Kelnick, Eugenio Suarez, and Teoscar Hernandez, who were all taking at-bats in the heart of that order last year. Their K rates last year were Kalanick, 31.7%, Gino, Mm. 30.8%, Teoscar, 31.8%. Compare that to Garver, 23.8%. Let's compare the isolated power numbers. Kalanick, 167. Gino, 159. Teo, 178. Garver, 230. And when you look at the slugging, the weighted on base average and the expected weighted on base average between all these guys, it shows similar disparities there. So with Garver, you're effectively replacing one of those guys who's hitting in the heart of your order with more power, fewer strikeouts and more walks for only 12 million a year. And I know that Seattle has never been the best place for hitters, but I feel like Mitch is adaptable enough to overcome that. And he hit 22 home runs last year, 
22 expected home runs in Seattle. And another reason I like this for the Mariners is they're effectively getting a hitting coach out of this deal too, because Mitch is one of those guys that just lives and breathes hitting. So he's going to be an extremely valuable resource and a mentor. So the Mariners went into the offseason with this goal of increasing their power while also cutting down on strikeouts in their lineup without spending more money, which is one of those goals you hear people say, and you're like, well, yeah, of course you'd want to do that. But like, how? Who's the guy you're going to do that with? They found him somehow. And I think Mm -hmm. they have achieved their goal uh, in part by signing Mitch Garver. And I think this is a deal that's going to look really smart by the end of the year. Yeah, 100% Taylor. And I think Garver is so valuable, not only because of all the on field stuff that you brought, but just for that cachet going into the Mariners clubhouse. Like, dude, I just want a World Series. Like, I was just in your division and I just want a World (laughs) Series. And he had some obviously huge moments in, in the playoffs as well. He had some great moments, you know, in the ALCS. He had some great moments in the ALDS as well versus Baltimore. He had a grand slam against Baltimore in that ALDS. So, yeah, he is uh, he's a huge, huge piece for the Seattle Mariners. And like you said, they needed to cut down on the strikeouts while adding more power. And, yeah, there's not many players like that that exist, you know. So, listen, Taylor, I'm going to get into my number one signing, okay? And, you know, Taylor, we talked about this episode last week after we got done recording our Scott Boris uh, episode. And I told you I might just go scorched earth and make this oh. the worst contract of the offseason. The more and more I thought about it, I came to the conclusion. And it's a conclusion I didn't want to come to because I'm naturally a pessimist and a negative person. This is by far and away the best contract of this offseason. It's Shohei Otani, 10 years, $700 million to the oh, Los Angeles wow. Dodgers. Now, that was a really again, setup. if this was your traditional 10 year $700 million contract, which, by the way, if there was it's ever really a traditional... <laughs> 10 years, $700 million contract. I don't know if that exists. Okay. Yeah. But if he was getting paid 70 million a year, every year for the next 10 years, like the contract would normally be, I'd say you got me. There's no way this can be the best contract. Otani's coming off his second Tommy John surgery, apparently, although they've been very secretive and weird about if that actually happened. Yeah. And it comes to the question, you know, how will he be used pitching going forward with his injury history? Is he on a strict innings limit when he comes back? Does he eventually move to the bullpen? Who knows? But you know, how to protect yourself from those questions you decide, or should I say Otani decides because he wants to win championships. Hey, you only got to pay me 2 million a year while I'm on the team and then give me the rest of my money while I'm retired. Okay. For those people who are saying, Oh, that bill's going to come due 2034 through 2044 Dodgers. Does anybody watching this even who know cares? what they'll be doing from 2034 to 2044? <laughs> no. Does anyone really care about the 2034 to 2044 Dodgers right now? No. Uh, let's talk more about what makes this the best deal for the Dodgers, okay? You get one of the league's best hitters for $2 million a year for the next decade, okay? You get one of the league's best pitchers for $2 million a year for nine out of the next 10 years, potentially, okay? That is not only a massive bargain, but it also allows you to sign a 25-year-old potential ace and Otani's countryman, Yamamoto, to a historic deal. You also have the flexibility to make other winning moves and decisions, like going and getting Teoscar Hernandez, going and getting Tyler Glass now. So Otani's performance, obviously, on the field performance, and your ability to go get more championship-caliber players make this a huge on-the-field win for them. Off the field, attention worldwide, business ventures, you're in LA and you have the most star-studded team in the sport. Home games are going to be ridiculous. You can charge whatever you want for a ticket, whatever you want for a jersey. A hundred bucks a a Dodger dog. Who cares? (laughs) People are going to sell out Dodger Stadium every single game and you are going to profit a ton from it. So there's literally no losing from the Dodgers perspective. The only way you lose this from the Dodgers is if you literally lose. If you pay this contract and a decade from now, you have zero championships to show for it. I'll be back in the 2020, uh, 2034 version of Bush League Bros <laughs> as a 36-year-old man to tell you I was wrong about this and it was the worst contract of the 2024 20, offseason, okay? But I don't believe that, that they're not going to win any titles with Otani over the next decade. I just don't. I think they're going to win at least a couple, and if they do, it's obviously worth it. So for every reason in the book, Shohei Otani's 10-year, $700 million deal is the biggest, obviously, best to, and obviously, and the biggest deal in MLB history by two hundred fifty million dollars. By the way, okay, it's clearly and obviously the best signing of the twenty twenty four MLB offseason. 
I mean, it was a match made in heaven. There was, in, in my opinion, there was just nowhere else where this guy was going to go. The one that's more interesting to me is the Yamamoto deal. That one, I mean, paying that guy over 12 years is a really, really interesting move to me. So in combination, I think those two deals, those are going to be the deals that we, you know, like you said, at 20, 2034, when we're, you know, graying men doing this, doing this, this podcast segment still, hopefully we're going to look back and be like, man, these were either the best deals that the Dodgers have ever made, or these were the worst deals the Dodgers have ever made. Yeah. And it's time will tell, I guess. But my favorite thing about this Shohei Otani deal is that since he's technically only making $2 million this year, Austin Barnes is technically making more money on the books than Shohei that's crazy. this year. And that's just one of my favorite things about this Dodgers team. So if Austin Barnes and Shohei Otani ever go out to like a nice dinner, you know, maybe 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 Barnes he just picks up the bill. It's like, hey, you know, Come I, on, man. I know you're only making two million this year. Like, let me let me pick this up for you, buddy. Like, <laughs> welcome to L.A. <laughs> Tries to little bro him. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll get it, big dog. Don't worry yeah. about it. Don't worry about it, man. I got you. But that is going to do it for us today here for the Bush League Bros. Thank you guys so much for watching. Again, do not forget to like and subscribe. We would greatly appreciate it. Also, comment down below who you think the best free agent signings of the MLB offseason are so far. And then be sure to follow us on Instagram and TikTok as well, at Bush League Bros. I've been having a lot of fun going back and forth with you guys in the comments on those posts. So keep commenting, and I will keep going back at you in the comments. And also, follow at the House Call Sports on all platforms as well. If you like content from all sports, that is the place to go. And that's going to be it for us. Peace.